More information has finally been unveiled for Fire Emblem Three Houses thanks to the recent Nintendo Direct. And while it only seems to be a taste of what the full game has to offer, the possibilities have us quite intrigued to say the least. But there's always more hiding in a Nintendo trailer. So we're calling upon the old analysis machine yet again to see what secrets and hidden details it can find. And we'll begin with the story of Three Houses. The basic idea is that your character is the son or daughter of a mercenary captain by the name of Geralt. Naturally, this means that the character creator has returned, although we don't get to see much of it. All we know so far is what the default appearance of the male and female protagonist looks like, though presumably at least the hairstyle, hair color, and voice clips can be changed. As the previous trailer revealed, the default name of the player character is Byleth, which is how we'll be referring to him from now on. But it is truly impressive to see the cutscenes rendered with Byleth, no matter which design you choose, showing that everything is being done in real time. But we're going to try to match the separate scenes shown during the Direct to reconstruct the beginning of this story. From what we can tell, it begins with the three house leaders from the Garig Mach Monastery's officer school joining Byleth and Geralt on some kind of expedition. Geralt seems familiar with the church's soldiers, as he likely gets contracts from them pretty often, while Edelgard, Dimitri, and Claude gravitate around Byleth, as they seem roughly the same age. Why these three are there is hard to say, but it's likely meant to start preparing the player for what house they'll ultimately be a part of. At some point though, the group encounters bandits, and things seem to go very wrong, as one scene shows Byleth taking an axe to the back. This specific scene takes place after he has met the mysterious young girl, Sothis. It appears that as Byleth takes the axe to the back, he's transported in front of Sothis, who then awakens and asks what brings him there. A later scene shows Byleth bent over with his sword, the same position as when he was attacked with the axe, which we believe confirms our theory on the order of events. It's here that some kind of pact is formed with Sothis. We can even make out pieces of what she says, specifically her mentioning Byleth needing someone to guide him from now on. Who appears within your mind. It appears that she ties in directly with his newly awakened powers that the narrator mentions. But before we get to those powers, let's take a closer look at Sothis. By all appearances, she seems to be a manichete or a dragon that stored her powers in a dragon stone in order to take on a human form, much like the series' most well-known dragon, Tiki. Interestingly, her design includes ropes that are bound across her chest, though they don't seem to be restricting her in any way. Red and white ribbons are tied in her hair and on each wrist, while the rest of her outfit consists of black and gold. We only ever see her on this dark throne, so is she bound there in some way? It's hard to say for sure, but we do believe she grants or at least instructs Byleth on his new power. What is that new power? Well, let's return to the scene where Byleth has an axe in his back, which takes place after this meeting with Sothis. We see a warping effect as events seem to rewind, then the bandit tries to attack with his axe again. But this time Byleth is prepared and disarms him. Based on this, we believe Byleth has the power to slightly rewind time, much like Mila's turn wheel in Fire Emblem Echoes. Players will likely have limited chances to fix mistakes in each battle, which was a handy feature in that game, so it's good to see it return here. This attack by the bandit seems to take place on the outskirts of a village. Perhaps this is where the initial meeting between Byleth, Edelgard, Dimitri, and Claude takes place, and the walking scene we saw earlier is after this. Either way, it seems Edelgard in particular was the one Byleth was protecting, with the other two coming in after the bandit is defeated. What's odd though is that someone in this group recognizes Byleth's new power and feels it's suitable enough to offer him a teaching position at the Garig Mach Monastery's Officer Academy. Perhaps the position was supposed to go to your father first. After all, other students do mention him, so he's a man of some renown. Maybe he denied the offer, but once this power is awakened, he recommends Byleth so his son might gain some modicum of control and learn its origin. This is all just guesswork on our part, though. We then see the Garig Mach Monastery itself, which houses not only the Officer Academy, but the Church of Saros and their personal army, the Knights of Saros. It's safe to say that Saros is the goddess that the narration spoke of when giving the history of the Fodlan continent, but why does the church need its own militia? Is it to settle disputes, promote unity by having people of each country work together, or simply a display of its own power? There's not enough information to know for sure, but it is odd that if the goal is unity, that the students are divided amongst houses representing each country. At any rate, a key image does portray a lot of dragons, so it's likely that Sothis has some kind of connection to the church's history. The monastery itself seems quite large, but it's difficult to tell if it's made up of several structures and this is just the academy, or if everything is integrated together. 
We believe it's the latter due to Byleth and his father looking up at a particular building and a scene showing the Academy students and Saros Knights eating in the same mess hall. The monastery is amongst the mountains with a defensive wall below, making us wonder why it would need to protect itself from an attack, unless there's some kind of greater enemy out there, which is certainly possible. The final question we have regarding the Church of Saros is what this ceremony is about. It's definitely important as the leader of the church is present with what appears to be a high-ranking official. In addition, the knights behind them are holding the flags and colors of the Black Eagle House. While we're not completely sure, we believe this is the ceremony that takes place once Byleth has chosen the house that he will represent. In this case, it's the Black Eagles, which we'll see more evidence of later in the analysis. There's still some story elements to cover that were revealed at the end of the trailer, but we'll save those for the end of the analysis as well, since there's not much connective tissue between them yet. For now, let's take a closer look at what Byleth will actually be doing in the Officer Academy as a teacher. Our first proper look at the Officer's Academy shows some of the students training in the yard. Two are on the side with a blonde girl wielding a practice lance, and four in the back with Dimitri likely in the center. In fact, a later scene shows what's likely a close-up of this fight as he takes on multiple students at once. We suspect this scene takes place when Byleth first enters the Academy and gets a small tour. This is the training yard where we see more students, and specifically Dimitri. And that's all but confirmed as we get a close-up of the students on the right with a boy practicing archery. As we'll learn later, the girl he's with is named Annette. Continuing this tour, we see an older professor teaching two of the students magic, while the next scene shows another teacher reading to an entire group of students. There's writing on the chalkboard as well, but it's not entirely clear what she's teaching the class. It could be educational basics like a language class, or even tactics and history. Interestingly, the students have different symbols sewn into the back of their uniforms, but we couldn't clearly determine what they mean. They're different from the house sigils, so they may have more of a connection to their rank or status in the school. Notably, the symbol on the back also determines the style of their uniform, potentially hinting at a further connection to their rank in the academy. We then learn about each of the houses at the academy and how each represents one of the three major countries. As the trailer states, Edelgard is the leader of the Black Eagle House and the heir of the Adrestian Empire. Dimitri is the house leader of the Blue Lions and Prince of the Fargus Kingdom. And Claude is the leader of the Golden Deer House and future leader of the Leicester Alliance. As we stated before, it's curious that rather than promoting true unity, the houses are split along countries. The students can interact together as we've seen, but we wonder if there's perhaps a competitive element between the houses. Otherwise, this seems to serve as a way for future leaders to learn more about leading while interacting with people from all over the continent. More interesting, though, is how each showcase of the three main characters also has a scene playing in the background. We mentioned before how Dimitri shows him facing off against other students in combat, but Edelgard and Claude seem to be more about interacting with other members of their house. Edelgard is demonstrating some kind of magic to a group of students, many of whom we'll see later when talking about the combat. Claude, on the other hand, is talking about a map of the continent with his classmates, so it's possible that they're planning a mission. If it's like Dimitri, then both might be demonstrating to the player the various facilities that can be used to improve your units at the academy, which seems extremely likely. Before choosing a house, it looks like the player will have a chance to meet many of the characters to help decide which they'd like to be a part of. It's a good option as some players may not like a leader, but still like the other students in that house. And this chance to meet them is absolutely the case as Annette, who's on the left, mentions to Mercy that she thinks Byleth is the mercenary everyone is talking about. As we'll see later, the students refer to Byleth as Professor once he becomes a teacher. The next encounter has the player meeting Sylvain Jose Gautier. It's rare to meet a Fire Emblem character with a full name, but this name is even more significant than that. Gautier is actually a region on the Fodland map on the northern border in the Kingdom of Fargus. This means that Sylvain is a member of the Blue Lion House, but it also confirms that many of the other students at the Officer Academy are the sons and daughters of nobles. Perhaps other characters will have surnames of other locations on the map. However, it's likely that not every possible unit will be a noble. Next, we meet Raphael and Leone who we saw with Claude in his earlier scene, making them members of the Golden Deer House. Again, this dialogue shows that this is still before Byleth becomes a teacher, but he is well known as a mercenary and the son of Captain Geralt. We should also mention that during these conversations, there are options to let them auto-advance or even look at a log of past dialogue in case you miss something. Eventually, you'll have to choose a house, though we still don't know how big of a change this will entail. Will they have unique stories, or just unique characters, or does it simply shift when certain characters join you? 
The trailer provides no insight on this, unfortunately, but there's a ton of potential in terms of replayability depending on which route Three Houses takes. In the case of this trailer, though, the player picks the Black Eagle House of Edelgard. And we soon get a look at this lineup of Black Eagle students in the next scene, where you've already taken over as a professor. It looks like this batch of students have been chosen to join the Saros Knights in order to suppress some rampaging bandits as real-world experience is part of the Academy. What's intriguing, though, is the text in the top left stating where this is taking place and the time of day. So it's possible that different events could happen around the Academy depending on the time. This is the only time we see it, though, so it's difficult to say how important it really is. We'll get to the battle mechanics soon enough, but we did want to mention that the eight students here do join Byleth in the mission that takes place afterward. We even get most of their names throughout the trailer. Petra is the girl on the far left, Linhart is the boy to the left of Edelgard, Bernadetta is the girl to the right of Edelgard, Dorothea is next to her, then there's Casper with the light blue hair, and Ferdinand on the far right. The only one whose name we don't know is the boy between Petra and Linhart. But as a professor of these students, you do more than just command them in battle. You also develop lesson plans to expand their combat abilities, which takes place in the same room as the teacher reading before. As part of lesson plans, you can choose which students to tutor and how, have the game automatically tutor them, put them in a group task to help multiple students, and set goals for them to reach. However, there seems to be a limited number of times you can tutor students in one sitting. There's a green bar at the top with the number 3, while tutoring has a 1 next to it, and auto-tutor has a 3. So it appears likely that you can only improve 3 students at a time with each lesson plan. Notably though, group tasks and setting goals don't have these numbers, meaning that tutoring likely gives immediate benefits, while tasks and goals are something focused on over time. And we actually see evidence of this in the trailer. Our look at tutoring comes in the form of Dorothea. With this, you can train students in any skill you prefer, and thanks to a later scene, we know exactly what each of these skills are. Swords, lances, axes, bows, fighting, reason, faith, authority, heavy armor, riding, and flying. While many of these are proficiencies we've seen in the past, many are seemingly new. However, with the exception of fighting and authority, all of these skills tie into familiar aspects of Fire Emblem. For example, as we'll soon see, Reason is the skill tied to offensive magic, while Faith relates to healing magic. We'll explain each of these as they appear. Each student is unique, though, as they'll acclimate to certain skills more than others, as indicated by the up arrows, down arrows, and pointing fingers. While we don't see what the pointing fingers do, the up arrows indicate that bonuses will be added in terms of experience in that skill, allowing them to grow more quickly. However, it's possible that the skill bonuses are determined by the growth goals that we see in the bottom right. Swords and Reason are chosen, and those are the ones with possible bonuses. Is that because they're goals, or did the player choose those goals because of the natural bonuses? Unfortunately, there's no real way to know for sure. We do suspect that the down arrow will lower the amount of experience gained toward that skill, but it still may be worth doing as there are three stars next to it as well. Does this indicate some kind of special art will be learned, something we'll see more of in the combat section, or are arts earned from the pointing finger? Again, there's no evidence to show how it actually works. There is one more aspect to tutoring thanks to the meter in the top right. It seems a student can be tutored up to three times, so the player can choose to focus on a single student or spread the lessons around. Once the type of tutoring is chosen, the experience points are assigned. In this case, granting 1.5 times the normal amount thanks to that bonus. But this also increases her bond with Byleth, creating another aspect of choosing which students you want to tutor. Perhaps it's possible that group tasks strengthen the bonds of all the students in that group? Unfortunately, we don't see what that entails. Instead, we get a better look at how the setting goals option works. For Linhart, his apparent default focus is reason and faith. But there's also the option to create a custom focus, although they can't be doubled up in order to grow faster. On the right, we can see his skill level with each one available, although we can't help but wonder if that'll be expanded, as there are four open slots. We're not sure what they could be expanded with, though, as many of the major aspects of Fire Emblem combat are represented here. We should also mention that the goal list specifically mentions that these are solo study skills, so it's possible that group tasks will have unique group study skills as well. Although we don't see the pair-up option in the trailer, it's possible that unique arts could be used depending on which characters are paired. Finally, we see that Linhart's tutor meter is completely filled. This means he hasn't been tutored at all since Dorothea's meter drained as she was being taught. We do wonder, though, if other activities will drain this meter, or if the face next to it has any special meaning. 
Either way, the potential customization for every character is quite exciting, but there's still one more aspect of the Academy to see. It looks like it's possible to have every character be any class you want. All that's required is having them learn the necessary skills. We don't see a complete list, but some of the classes include Mercenary, Thief, Knight, Cavalier, Brigand, which is also the first time it's been a playable class since Fire Emblem Thracia 776, Archer, Mage, and Priest. The example given is the Brigand class, which requires the student to have their axe skill at C or higher. However, an intermediate seal is also necessary, although the trailer does show where these can be earned. In an earlier scene, it looks like training tournaments can take place between the houses. Here we see Ferdinand face off against Sylvain, who we believe is part of the Blue Lion House. Both are equipped with training lances, meaning that even if you lose, your character won't die. Interestingly, this is round two, so it looks like your chosen student is healed between rounds. The first round only netted Ferdinand 50 gold, but winning the second round will net him 300 gold and an intermediate seal necessary to choose a class. However, there is an option to withdraw if the matchup isn't looking so good. While your character can't die, it's likely that the rewards earned up until that point won't be kept. Withdrawing allows the players to keep what they've earned, ensuring the intermediate seal, for example. There is something strange about this, though. Ferdinand has three skill symbols beneath his stats, and as we just saw, only two skills can be focused on at a time. So maybe the group skill option is one that a group of students all focus on that is unique to them. That's the only solution that we can really think of. It's worth noting that Sylvain also has skill symbols beneath his stats. Could this be a hint that students from other houses can eventually join his units? We're not sure, but it has us curious. The fight itself doesn't seem to contain any strategy, though. Instead, it's just the fighters trading blows until one is knocked out. So it only seems to come down to making sure your strikes hit harder and more accurately. But it also serves to keep the training brief. Returning to the class change scene, there are aspects of this that leave us curious. We see that the exam contents provide a brief overview of what the class can do, but there's also an option to flip through the pages with the shoulder buttons. What other information could be shown? Unfortunately, we don't see, but having skills be required to become these classes makes it possible to give educated guesses on what skills are necessary for each one. Knights will likely need heavy armor and a weapon. Cavaliers may need riding in a weapon, Pegasus Knights could require lances and flying, and even Wyvern Riders may be possible with flying and axes. And all of this is up to the player. To finish this off, once the class is chosen, we see Edelgard take the exam, pass, and get promoted. The last aspect of the Academy that we see is a scene taking place in the Mess Hall, which seems to be where the students can interact with each other and potentially increase their bonds. Neither of these students seem to be part of the Black Eagle House, though they may join later, and only the boy, Ash, is given a name. We don't see what benefits the Mess Hall may provide beyond these interactions, and there could still be more to the Academy itself, but as of right now, this is looking to be one of the most customizable casts in the history of the series thanks to these options. Of course, this is all just preparations for the battles. Let's see what Three Houses has to offer in terms of the actual fights. This brings us back to the scene where Edelgard and the other Black Eagle students are preparing to face off against a group of bandits. We soon arrive at the scene and the camera pans over the battlefield, showing a chest in the process. So either a thief or a chest key will be required to open it. As for the bandits, there are 11 to defeat on this map. These include swordsmen, mages, and archers, while the lead bandit, Costas, wields an axe along with a few others. We then get a look at the player's side of the field as the battle starts. We can see the eight students from the Black Eagle House are indeed here along with Byleth, as each one is easily marked by a profile picture and a symbol noting their weapon type. Petra wields a sword, Casper has an axe, Dorothea has a tome, Ferdinand has a lance, Bernadetta has a bow, Byleth has a sword, Edelgard uses an axe, Linhart has a healing tome, and the character whose name we don't know has a different kind of tome. Perhaps this ties into authority in some way, but based on what we see later, we're not so sure. It may simply be another type of elemental tome, or maybe it provides status effects. Another oddity are the three green arrows arranged like the Triforce that is next to each character, with the exception of Dorothea. We don't really know what these indicate. Of course, they tie into some other aspect of the battles, but it's never demonstrated in the trailer, and there's really not even a hint as to what it could be. Perhaps they indicate who can use the new Gambit? Or maybe they tie into the three stars we saw during Dorothea's tutoring, which is why she doesn't have any of them. 
But why does everyone else when this is clearly an early battle in the game? After all, both Byleth and Bernadetta are only level 2. Like the previous trailer showed, movement is still grid-based and the characters don't follow the exact path, opting to move more naturally across the landscape. The cursor also indicates what type of terrain it is, along with the bonuses it allows, if any, just like past games. Once Bernadetta moves, options appear for her to take, including attack, special abilities known as arts, the new gambits, items, trade, and weight. Intriguingly, the rescue command doesn't appear from past games, though it may be left off if not available. After all, it's possible trade wouldn't be an option if she wasn't next to Edelgard. It's possible that Bernadetta has less constitution and just can't pick up Edelgard. Once attack is selected, her held weapons are shown, including their stats. Weapon durability returns, meaning they'll break after the listed number of uses. The Iron Bow is clearly marked as being effective against flying units, while the Mini Bow, which was previously called the Short Bow before Fire Emblem Fates, is likely still unique in that it only has a range of one. While it lacks range, it would allow the user to counterattack if they were hit by an enemy that gets in close. Speaking of, battle lines for the two other bandits show which of your units they're most likely to attack, although, oddly, the one Bernadetta targets never has a battle line up here. Once the weapon is chosen, we see the stats for the attack. Bernadetta will do 10 damage with 100% accuracy and a 2% chance of getting a critical hit on the enemy. This bandit is classified as a thief, which is odd considering thieves can't wield axes in Fire Emblem. Maybe all the bandits are called thieves despite the class name? It's also worth noting that the enemy's weapon also shows how many uses it has before it breaks, a first for the series, at least on this screen. Above the character portraits, the player can quickly cycle through the different weapons to compare stats and even choose a combat arc to use. It seems much easier for players to decide the best course of action. But what has us really curious are the three symbols at the top. Two have to do with the skills Bernadetta is likely focusing on, but the third shows a person engulfed in flames. Perhaps this is an ability or gambit she's working toward with the group? We don't know for sure though, especially because this is a really early battle. Before attacking, Bernadetta does choose to use a combat art, Curved Shot, even though it only does one more damage. However, more importantly, it extends her range, allowing her to potentially target any of the three bandits. This comes with a cost though, as the number three is shown next to Curved Shot. We suspect that this means that rather than being a single use of the Iron Bow, it would instead be three uses, maybe even four if just using the bow still counts. This provides a risk versus reward element where players have to decide if it's worth wearing down the weapon sooner in exchange for potentially useful abilities. It also explains why these bows have more uses than ever before. The Iron Bow had 45 uses at most in previous games, while the Mini Bow only ever maxed out at 22. So, balancing has been considered when it comes to these arts. Like the reveal trailer showed before, units on either side have fighters join them to make it seem like more of a large-scale battle, though oddly the bandit has archers with him despite using an axe. Perhaps it's possible to customize what these support units will be? Fortunately, we do learn a bit more about them later in the trailer, but the next scene focuses on Petra in another battle. It jumps right into her attack though, so we're not sure if this is the same battle or a different location, but we suspect the former. That said, there's something downright weird about Petra's attack. She's only wielding an iron sword, yet she has a 100% chance of getting a critical hit. How is that possible? It can't be an art or a gambit, as neither are listed, so maybe it's a natural ability or some kind of new spell was used on her? We really don't know, but it's left us kind of bewildered. Despite that, we do see that critical attacks still do three times the damage that normally would have been done. Petra shows off even more changes though. After defeating the enemy, she earns her experience. But there's way more here than just her own progress toward leveling up. She earns 48 experience for defeating the bandit, but before those are tallied, we see that it takes 110 experience to level up. In past Fire Emblem games, the amount needed was always 100, so it seems leveling might be rebalanced as well. In addition, the skills that Petra is focusing on gain experience, showing what's needed in order to raise their rank. They're collectively known as a professor level. Her sword skill earns 3 points, while the authority skill obtains only 2 points, likely because it wasn't what was used to earn the experience. This new experience screen also shows how long until a character's class is mastered. While we don't know Petra's class, it's definitely still early in the game. Maybe the more a class is mastered, new gambits or arts unlock? Either way, she only earns one point, so it seems to tie into the amount of enemies defeated, unless certain enemies count for more points. It seems like this could take a while, so maybe skirmishes will be an option so characters can work toward mastering their class. 
Finally, we see that the support units that appear when attacking are called battalions, and they have their own levels. In this case, they're infantrymen, which likely explains the boot symbol. It also specifies that they're Empire infantry, and Edelgard does come from an Empire. If her idea that each of these students are nobles from that country is correct, then it likely means that these battalions are their retainers joining them in battle, providing context as to why these soldiers are helping students. But the fact that battalions can be leveled and have different types also means that our theory that they can be assigned to cover for weaknesses is also possible. Unfortunately, we don't get to see a specific battalion screen. Another battle scene takes place in a grassy field near some ruins and feature our first look at the faith skill in action. Rather than wield staves, healers now have tomes as well, as we see here with Linhard aiding Byleth. We then see the new fist skill in action as Casper fights with a pair of iron gauntlets. They seem to have a low attack, but they more than make up for it with a high speed, which grants the double attack, and a greater critical chance. But this brings up another point. We haven't seen any evidence of the weapon triangle yet. Now, this seems to be on purpose as no attack used throughout the trailer has an advantage or disadvantage even if the triangle is in place. But we do wonder how these new fist attacks fit in if it does return. And if it doesn't, what will the new advantage of using these different weapons be? Hopefully the next trailer answers these questions. The attack with Casper also features a new interior location and a new enemy, a Western Church soldier. Is the Western Church still part of the Church of Saros, making this more of a skirmish? Or are there rival churches trying to cause trouble? Beyond this scene, these units never appear again, so it's another thing we just don't know at the moment. We then get our first look at Gambits, which seem to be able to get a boost from up to three other characters. And this is later in the game, as the three boys helping Edelgard all have different clothes in the standard Academy uniform, so they've gone through a class change. Despite seeing this Gambit boost, we're still no closer to understanding how it works, but a single frame before the portraits appear does reveal the positions of the four units in question. One is to the right of the monster, with two more directly in front of it, and another just behind Edelgard. According to the attack screen, this is called a coordinated gambit, which we presume means that all four characters shown will attack one after the other. Based on all of this, it's possible that pair-ups are a thing of the past, and gambits are a full-blown replacement. Maybe even more complex attack patterns will become available as the game goes on. But this scene also provides our only clear look at what the Authority skill does. At least we presume this is related to that skill. Instead of attacking herself, Edelgard sends forth her battalion. And this is no gambit or art, as it's clearly marked where her weapon would be. In this case, it's an assault troop. But what's really fascinating is that she's next to the monster on the map, and yet it cannot counterattack. Is this a major advantage of using a battalion? And could it be balanced by not allowing Edelgard to counter if she's attacked? We're not sure, but this attack also causes a fair amount of damage, though there's no chance of getting a critical. So does this mean that leveling the battalion strengthens their potency in combat for the authority skill? It would be a way to balance them since they can't really be limited to a certain number of uses, unless the amount of troops you have decreases the lower your health is. And Petra did have the Authority skill equipped, so leveling the battalions could be unique to it. Then there's the monster itself. It's known as the Black Beast and is utterly massive, taking up four spaces on the battle map. It's not alone either, as bandits can be seen behind it. The Black Beast uses a fist weapon called the Crest Stone of Gautier, and as we mentioned before with Sylvain, Gautier is a real location on the map found on the northern edge of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. This means that despite choosing the Black Eagle House, you won't be limited to only visiting that country. Still, why is this creature wielding a crest stone as a weapon? We have an idea, but it should be noted that this creature appears in a cutscene toward the end of the trailer, providing an even better sense of the sheer scale and ferocity of it. But we think this creature was given life by the man we see earlier. Not only does he have an evil look to him, but we see him wielding a dark energy. We wonder if he's using this energy to summon creatures like the Black Beast, or if he's infusing objects with this dark energy to give them life. After all, we do see some kind of black goop spreading around a symbol. Maybe the reason the Black Beast wields the Crest Stone of Gautier is because it is the Crest Stone. This villain uses the dark energy to give life to a statue, which is the substance we see later. His power is a corrupting influence, which is why the trailer ends with that energy heading straight for Byleth, though he's unflinchingly staring it down. 
We're almost done here, but there are still three characters in these final cutscenes that we wanted to bring mention to. The first seems to be an orange-haired girl with a shaking red eye. We never see her full face, but we don't believe that she's any of the students that we've seen up to this point. Is she getting corrupted by the villain, or is something else going on? How important is she to this story? And the same goes to the swordsman wielding a glowing red sword we see here. Again, we haven't seen her before, but she doesn't look like a student of the Academy. What could her role be? The last character we see is a mage wearing a plague mask, so it's likely that this is a follower of the villain. The plague mask even makes thematic sense if this villain is spreading a corrupting influence like a virus. And that's everything that we could find in the Fire Emblem Three Houses Direct trailer. It looks like there's been some significant changes to the formula with a greater sense of unit customization, a swifter interface, and brand new combat ideas. There's still plenty of questions though, such as the overall story, whether the weapon triangle will return, how different each playthrough is when selecting a house, and what kind of relationships can be forged among your units. We can't wait to see what awaits as more information comes out. Of course, if we missed anything in this analysis, let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe to Game Explained for more on Fire Emblem and other things gaming.